Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Binance Podcast. My name is Wee Jo. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance. So what I want to do with this show is to spend time talking to specialists, entrepreneurs, scholars, influencers, basically leading people from a variety of industries. Hopefully through these conversations, we can share insights on how blockchain is changing not just these different industries, but also in changing the world. Here's a quick disclaimer. All opinions expressed by our host and our guests on this podcast are merely their own opinions. They do not imply any endorsements or opinions of their companies. You should not take these opinions as specific investment advice, as you will be solely responsible for your own investment. Hey everyone, this is Wee, and thank you very much for joining us in another episode of the Binance Podcast. I'm here joined by Ophelia Snyder, who is the President and Chief Product Officer for Amun. Um, for those of you who actually don't know, um, Binance actually worked with Amun to issue a BNB-based ETP exchange traded product that was actually listed in the six uh, stock exchange in Switzerland. So, and that was last year. And I think Amun itself have been pretty active in the exchange traded product category. But I think recently they've come out with a lot of new tokenized or token forms uh, that I actually think is really, really interesting. And I think when we worked with Amun to sort of set up the, the BNB ETP, their sort of premise was basically trying to bring a lot of the more popular tokens, especially I think with BTC and ETH and then maybe even Basket, to traditional investors that can only buy traditional financial products. And I think that they act as a, a really innovative bridge at that point. But I have we have Ophelia joining us today to really give us an understanding of, you know, what's the origin story for Amun, uh, how they've grown so far, and then what innovation they're bringing to the overall uh, financial markets and the crypto market with their recent uh, product launches. Thank you for joining us, Ophelia. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Really wonderful intro to the company. Covered a lot of the different points of what we do. So I think, you know, you sort of hit the nail on the head. We, We have, over the last almost two years, brought to market a number of different exchange traded products in traditional security formats. 11 of them actually both sort of single asset trackers like the BNB product, indexes and baskets, as well as income generating staking products and short products to traditional investors in the sort of, you know, more regulated security space. And now we are launching a new series of tokenized products. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into sort of like, you know, the product lines and then sort of the investor uptake of these products, can you give us a little bit of background of sort of like, you know, how you founded Amun with your co-founders and then personally how you got into sort of cryptocurrency in general? A little bit about your your background that would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I think I have a somewhat different story of how I ended up in crypto than most people. My co-founder and I have known each other for about 10 years. Uh, We met when we were both living in California kept in touch. He was running a variety of different startups. And I sort of went more traditional and went to finance and got into like more complex structured products. I started to become interested in crypto because I think financial plumbing is a fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. Seriously underrated this idea of the way markets actually operate um, and how much better they can be done on a blockchain. So simple things like there are oftentimes 10 counterparties involved in settling a single transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, you as the issuer, and I can tell you this from experience in our own products, you know, the average settlement chain will have five, six people in it at least. And it's all manual. And like, did the person type the thing in right before he went home for the day? Oh, wait, no, now that's a hanging trade. We'll get to it tomorrow. No problem. This, and all of that costs money, Mm -hmm. insane amounts of money that people spend on this infrastructure. And so for me, Crypto was the perfect way of solving that. How do you make financial markets actually efficient, actually transparent, and allow people to have significantly more control over that structure than they do now and actually have you know, a real understanding for it? And so that was my interest in crypto, and it dates back to you know, when I was still living in California. My co-founder and I started talking, and we were having very similar issues around you know, people we knew, people in our families wanting to make investments in crypto, but you know, my mom was not going to go and open a wallet. She, you know, <laughs> it wasn't something she was ever going to be comfortable with. So how do you make this accessible to people who maybe don't mm-hmm. feel comfortable with the technical infrastructure while still providing them with both sort of the exposure to this 
the innovation as well as exposure to ultimately what is a much more efficient, um, this more efficient financial infrastructure. And so that that's how the company really got started was this dual interest in actually the markets what, and security what, infrastructure. Yeah, just professionally, what were you working on that got you into sort of focusing on the financial plumbing? <laughs> It's a, it's an odd one. I realize it's not mm. how, how most people end up in crypto, but for me, I was actually working as an M and A banker, but mostly doing really complicated stuff. So places where mm. like people's cap tables were, had a little more creativity to them, I think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I liked thinking about, okay, how can you craft these really, really interesting return profiles? How can you make this efficient and make this work well? And I think once you start digging into, wait, how do these products actually work? And then you realize all of the people that sit behind that, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's largely humans in a lot of places. And then that comes with both great positives and great negatives, but certainly quite a bit of complexity. And I think seeing that to me was fascinating. So it's, like I said, a, a little bit maybe of an unconventional path to crypto, but uh, for me at least, it is the culmination of, I think, where you know, you've been seeing efficiency gains in trading desks, more automation in trading. How do you actually make that clean? Blockchains do a really good job of that. Mm -hmm. This was about, what, this like two years ago? When you and your co-founder, you guys started thinking about the idea of, of founding a moon then, right? Yeah, about two years ago. What was that process like when you guys sort of initiated that from an idea to actually a product? This is a licensed financial product that you're creating because <laughs> so, those aren't easy. <laughs> no, no. Our, our ETP line are all mm -hmm. licensed regulated financial products mm -hmm. in this sort of very, maybe odd to use this terminology, but in a very sort of plain vanilla by the book standard way of building these products from the traditional world. So for me, it really came about one day in a coffee shop. We were sitting mm -hmm. talking about different ways in which you could access this market. And there wasn't anything that, you know, fit the box for someone who didn't want to have a wallet. And there wasn't anything mm -hmm. that was liquid and would allow you to do that. People were trying really hard at an ETF in the US, but weren't making much progress. And, you know, I think we're still at the point where we're trying to make that happen as an industry. So we started to explore potential other structures. And we looked at dozens of jurisdictions mm -hmm. to see what different structures, how they worked, what provided the best possible and most institutional grade structuring of the product. And, and what I mean mm -hmm. by that is it's a retail product and retail has access to it, but it's designed to meet the criteria that an institution applies when assessing whether or not to invest in a product at a construction basis. Mm -hmm. So we wanted something that was robust, easy to understand, and literally just does what it says on the label with no frills. Um, mm -hmm. And we were able to find that in Switzerland. That mm -hmm. process took quite some time and then figuring out how to structure it with crypto in a way they would be comfortable with took quite a bit more time. But then we were able to build that out to a pretty robust set of products that really give you access to a broad swath of the crypto space, as well as both the ability to go long and short. Mm. Can you go a little bit then in terms of, because I think when you guys first came out, it was basically just a physically backed, I would say, a shares that are physically backed by the crypto uh, currencies, right? How has sort of like your product line evolved for the last, you know, since you guys first came out? So I think we sort of got to split that into two. I think on the ATP mm -hmm. side, sure. it's really been about about growing strategies and about growing the range of tools that we have available to investors in those products. And mm -hmm. ultimately they haven't changed much. They're still standard exchange traded products that are fully physically backed. I mm -hmm. think the real departure from a product line perspective are the tokens that are coming out. Mm -hmm. They are very different, both in terms of product construction, their legal infrastructure, how they work as tech. I mean, their ERC tokens, they're obviously not public market securities. You know, they're actually set up to behave very differently than our ETPs, which are primarily, you know, physically backed long securities. I think the first token that is coming out, just as an example, um, is a new product called BTC Short. Mm -hmm. And it works by providing like a minus 1x notional exposure to Bitcoin's daily return. So it mm -hmm. actually has a daily rebalancing feature in it. Gotcha. which either you know captures gains and losses for that day and then changes your notional exposure to Bitcoin for that day. And that works as a combination of actually executing those trades on spot markets and borrowing on margin. So you're not actually getting futures-based exposure, you're actually looking at spot markets and how those are behaving and mm -hmm. getting your exposure essentially in a cash-based physical format instead of going through, you know, potentially a more complex product. So it works incredibly differently on the back end than our traditional ATPs do. 
it's obviously legally, these are essentially structured like a stable coin, so they're, they're not securities. And from a product perspective, they actually provide a very different kind of return profile in terms of tracking these daily returns um, and actually providing that rebalancing feature and the change in the exposure levels. Okay. I'll go back a little bit. Sort of when you guys are looking at, I would say, this product category, right? Because I think it seems like there's originally you guys started off with a single asset, I would say, sort of the ETPs. And you have also the index, right, which is a basket. And then now you're actually having this, you know, it was an inverse token, right? That's sort of correlated with an inverse price. Uh, I'd assume all of these ETPs are domiciled or regulated in Switzerland? Yes. Can you give a little bit of background in terms of why you guys chose Switzerland and then maybe sort of what are some of its uh, advantages? Because I think uh, in addition to sort of you know traditional, I would say, equity products, but it does seem like the inverse token is acts more like with some derivative characteristics to it. Um, sure, happy to address yeah, those two, two, two different um, questions, but I guess two why, different why, questions. Yeah, so, why Switzerland first? Yeah, uh, Switzerland for our regulated products made sense for a couple of reasons. I think if you're going to, there was an element of regulatory clarity. Mm-hmm. The Swiss are very clear on what crypto is, how it works, what it's designed to do, how they tax it, and quite frankly, how they assess uh, storage solutions and whether or not that's actually eligible underlying for securities products. So a lot of the problems that you see in the U.S. around, you know, questions about the underlying market, the Swiss have a much, are much more comfortable with that market construction and what the crypto markets actually look like in terms of being able to issue the securities. So part of it was just, they were absolutely crystal clear. This is how we're gonna treat your products. This is how we're gonna think about it. This is what you need to do, which basically is unique to them. Um, I think, or at least semi-unique to them globally. So that was part of it. The second piece was obviously neutrality. If you're going to launch products that actually do need a legal a legal domicile and you want somewhere where they're, you're not layering governmental and political risk on top of something that is deliberately non-governmental. It doesn't mm-hmm. really make sense to take decentralized assets that are specifically designed to provide currency exposures that are not linked to centralized monetary policy and then domicile mm-hmm. them somewhere where you're not going to get that level of neutrality and um, legal simplicity. That was the second piece of appeal. And finally, the last one, and I would maybe argue the most important, is they have a history of gold. They mm-hmm. really do understand how gold works, how gold custody works, how gold uh-huh. markets work. And ultimately, mm-hmm. it's very similar mm-hmm. um, to the way we deal with cold storage. Oh, wow. So so basically, from a custody perspective and from sort of a, a definition perspective, it seems like they're ahead of the curve versus um, <laughs> versus the U.S. then on that aspect. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Um, And it's why we've been able to do so much there. The tokenized products are different. They're not based in Switzerland. They're structurally, like I said, quite different. The logic for them really is to provide the market with a way to get downside protection without using complex products like put options that might not have the right liquidity or have to figure out how to manage margin. So the idea here is you're not you're not managing margin. You're not dealing with products that are more complex than the spot market. These are just a way of packaging the spot market um, and providing something along a similar line to a stable coin structurally mm-hmm. in the way that they work. So they have like a daily peg that you can actually look up and see like, what is the value of this thing and how can you burn it and get assets? And how, how do you think about that? Um, that process to us just provided a little bit of clarity to the market and a little bit of ease of use um, that is beneficial, especially in the case of users, especially in the crypto space who are maybe more comfortable with the technical aspects around how blockchains work, but maybe mm-hmm. less so with the complexities of things like put options and other potentially less liquid solutions. Okay. And for the ETPs, right? Because I remember when, when the BNB, the ABNB, which is the BNB ETP, were issued, I think it was initially listed on the six uh, Swiss exchange, right? Why the six Swiss exchange? Is that just part of the regulation, uh, the regulatory format that you guys were involved in? What is that exchange? So the six Swiss exchange is the national, the largest stock exchange in Switzerland. So it would be like thinking of it in terms of like a New York stock exchange mm-hmm. would be the U.S. based corollary. They're the, the largest market in the region, um, Switzerland, and they're one of the top 10 exchanges globally. And so that there was an appeal there in terms of distribution. There was also an appeal there. Obviously, the products are Swiss domiciled. So mm-hmm. it made sense from that perspective as well. In addition to the fact that we actually do see 
see quite a bit of demand in Switzerland for crypto products and quite a sophisticated set of investors looking at these products. We obviously also distribute the products across Europe, so it's not local in that way. The role that the exchange really plays is one of providing that continuous quotation and trading. So it's really a question of trading venue that we were attracted to in terms of you know what their fundamentals look like. Okay. Is it your goal then to have the, the ETPs listed in more exchanges? Like, are you guys working on that as well? And then what other exchanges are you exploring? So we, we've already listed the products on a couple of other exchanges. They trade on a, a German exchange as well as um, another Swiss exchange. And we're always looking to sort of expand that distribution network and those trading venues to provide ultimately what is a better user experience for holders of the assets. In, in terms of how have you found investor uptake for these products? Because I remember we were actually looking to organize a potential roadshow, right, to sort of explain the ETPs. Yeah, absolutely. So I think investor update has been very interesting. It, interesting combination of institutions and retail, about half and half in terms of number of trades, although obviously you're not where right. AOM comes from is going to be different because single trades from institutions can be significantly larger. But I think it says quite a bit about the market in terms of how you think about mm -hmm. the raw number of people coming into and out of the products. We've seen increases in institutional demand and ultimately what it, what comes down to increases in institutional comfort with the underlying assets. People really actually do under, are starting to understand at least, you know, what Bitcoin does, what's the value proposition here, why you want to hold it in your portfolio, what does that mean mm -hmm. in terms of correlations, how do you think about it and from a portfolio construction perspective, and not just Bitcoin. I think mm -hmm. we're starting to see a real expansion away from that and um, a much deeper understanding of the entire ecosystem, including assets like BNB, assets like Tezos, where you're now seeing investors in traditional regulated markets having an interest in other things than Bitcoin. And that includes some of our basket strategies and includes some of these other single asset trackers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been an interesting change um, since we first launched the business. I think we're seeing a much higher level of sophistication on the crypto side from the investors that we engage with. And I think we mm -hmm. saw, especially around you know the BNB product, a tremendous amount of interest in really understanding the fundamentals there, mm -hmm. which quite frankly, is new relative to, I think, where the market was a couple of years ago. Okay. My last question is, is um, what do we have to look forward to um, for 2020? Because I know that the market's relative, very challenging right now, given the COVID virus and then sort of the, a lot of the, the working situation. But I think, uh, you know, in our industry, you know, we're actually doing quite well taking this work, distributed working environment. How has your company reacted to the virus? And what are you looking forward to in terms of your strategy or your growth goals for 2020 and beyond? So I have to start this answer by saying mm -hmm. I have been amazed by how well our team has adapted to working mm -hmm. remotely. I mean, we, we already had some component of geographic distribution, but nothing of the scale we're talking about now. Um, you're talking about massive time zone differences and people have been incredible in their you know dedication and in their ability to turn out new product in this environment, as well as, you know, maintain the standards we, you know, have across our entire product suite. I think as I look towards the rest of the year and I think about COVID, I think from our perspective, I mean, we obviously all look forward to this being done and, and being back in the same space, but we also are really focused on expanding the strategies that we offer, especially on the token side, really expanding um, what we do in terms of research and education in the space around both our ETPs, but especially around our tokenized products and really expanding the reach of the tokens um, over the long term due to what we see as what are ultimately operational advantages to running um, and maintaining exposures through those formats. Mm -hmm. So when I look to the rest of the year, I think COVID has been a Certainly a challenge, but I think it's one I'm proud to say I think the, the team really rose to. Uh, we're very excited about what is ultimately a rather critical and rather large um, new set of products that are coming out over the next couple of weeks and months. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. This is really fun. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as, as much as I did. If you like this show, please share this episode on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, WeChat, or any other social media platforms. 
please don't forget to subscribe to the Binance podcast and see you next time.